from the station working for you. This is WRTV News at 6, streaming now. For five years now, a grieving mother has waited for closure when it comes to the murder of Deshaun Swanson. Now the FBI is offering a $25,000 reward. Thanks for joining us here at 6 o'clock. I'm Nicole Griffin. The FBI is hoping that a reward will break the silence in this case. Swanson was just 10 years old when he was shot in a drive by shooting in his neighborhood in the Butler Tarkington area. Today we talked with a father who remembers the 10 year old because his son played Pop Warner football with him. He tells us he still worries about his children and he wants Swanson's family to finally find closure. You know, being around this neighborhood, sometimes you, you know, when your kids grow up and they, they say they're going to the park, you know, you always um, wonder if they're going to come home safe or not, you know. And so the only thing you can do is just pray about that and hope your things will get better. Coming up tonight at 11 o'clock, more details on the quest for closure and how the 10 point coalition is responding to the reward that could finally help investigators crack the code of silence and arrest the shooter. Now to our continuing coverage of the coronavirus and its impact on Indiana. The state health department reports nine more deaths. 3,278 Hoosiers have now died with COVID-19. More than 110,000 Hoosiers have tested positive for the virus. More than 1.8 million people have been tested in Indiana. Now to your forecast, meteorologist Kyle Mounts is standing by and Kyle is starting to feel more and more like fall outside. Yeah, it is for sure, Nicole. And you know, I can't blame you if you did turn the heat on this morning because we had several areas that got down into the 30s, 37 degrees in Kokomo, Muncie, Terre Haute, 39 in the Columbus area. That's about 20 degrees below average for this time of year, 45 in the city. But hey, we enjoyed a lot of sunshine from start to finish again today and temperatures have recovered pretty nicely close to that 70 degree mark. We're at 68 right now in downtown 66 in Kokomo and upper 60s for you in the Columbus area all with that sunshine and a little bit of an east to northeast breeze out there. Not quite as gusty as what we had to deal with yesterday around 10 miles per hour and again it will continue to kind of subside here as we go through the next few hours. But this area of high pressure that's keeping us with the clear skies clouds well off to our south and also bringing in that east and continued dry flow of air. Over over the next few hours, if you are heading out, grab that jacket. Temperatures in the 50s by 9 o'clock with our sun setting at 746. I'll detail a warming trend in that seven day forecast in just a few minutes. All right, Kyle, thank you. Tonight, members of Indiana Task Force One are back home after spending the last week helping with recovery efforts from Hurricane Sally. The team just arrived back in Indiana within the last hour from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 35 members were activated last Sunday as a FEMA Urban Search and Rescue Task Force. The team, which is made up of firefighters from 14 local departments and other members, had equipment to help with operations like structural collapse and water rescue. We're always happy to go down there, even though we were stationed and did some training and may not have been used specifically in Alabama. The guys are still prideful for what we did, and it's just nice to be back in Indiana with our families. The deployment came just a few weeks after Indiana Task Force One members responded to the Gulf Coast to help with efforts for Hurricanes Marco and Laura. With 45 days until the general election, an event just wrapped up on the Near East side that allowed people to register to vote. The volunteer run voter registration event was held along the Penzi Trail in the Irvington neighborhood today. The goal today was to get 30 people registered. The organizer we spoke with says she has a personal reason for encouraging and assisting people with registering. I'm passionate about voting. I want others to be passionate about voting. Um, I am ready to go vote um, in a pandemic. Uh, I'll have my mask on. I'll have my hand sanitizer ready. Um, it's ignited me to, to sign up to be a poll worker. So I'm inspired by this election. I'm looking forward to be part of it. The nonprofit nonpartisan organization that held today's event is called When We All Vote. Their mission is to increase participation in every election and close the race and age voting gap by changing the culture around voting. With the election less than two months away, let WRTV be your central source for all you need to know before November 3rd. Go to our Vote in 2020 digital section where you will find everything you need to know there, including who's on your ballot, where you can vote, and when. 
how early voting works and when that starts, what mailing in your vote looks like, and any other questions you might have this election season. Keep a tab open at WRTV.com slash vote in 2020. We are just one day away from the Colts opener against the Minnesota Vikings, but this home game is going to be different from all of the rest. First, only 2,500 fans will be in attendance on Sunday. That was a rule the Colts and the Marion County Health Department put in place. Everyone inside of Lucas Oil Stadium must wear a mask. There are no exceptions unless eating or drinking. The Colts will put a pod seating arrangement into place. That means if you bought tickets with a group of people, you will get to sit together, but your group will be socially distanced in the stands from any other groups attending the game. Be sure to arrive early. There will be temperature checks before you're allowed into the stadium. The Colts and Vikings will kick off at 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. The Big Ten 2020 football schedules have just been released. This comes three days after conference officials reversed an earlier decision and decided to go ahead with football season. Both Indiana University and Purdue University will start the season with games on October 24th. IU takes on Penn State, Purdue tackles Iowa, and you can see the complete schedules by clicking on this story at WRTV.com. Join WRTV and the Indiana Black Expo for a free Zoom webinar on preparing for job interviews in the virtual environment. It's this Monday from noon until 2 p.m. presented by Cummins with tips from hiring Hoosiers partner Spirion Staffing. You can then put what you learn to use at our next virtual hiring Hoosiers employment opportunity fair. It starts at noon Tuesday, September 22nd, and it's also free. Companies looking to hire include FedEx, First, First Merchants Bank, Indianapolis Airport Authority, Lowe's, and many more. For more information and to register, just go to indianablackexpo.com. Girl Scouts of Central Indiana and Kroger are expanding their partnership by teaching girls about food insecurity in Indiana. A new patch is now available through Kroger's Zero Hunger, Zero Waste curriculum. Scouts learn about food deserts, zero waste in the plastic program. The goal is to encourage them to get involved in their own school, neighborhood or community to start making a difference. One out of eight people are hungry and one out of six kids are hungry. And there's a lot of kids in my school who go hungry and like they have to go to an office in our school to get food and I want to really help them so that they're, they don't have to go hungry. So I think there is absolutely this um, developmentally appropriate timing to bring this up and draw those connections for girls to say, you know what, while this may have not been close to home or didn't feel close to home, it is closer than ever. So part of the curriculum looks at maps and shows them where there's very real food insecurity in every zip code across our state. After completing the patch program, scouts are then encouraged to create a community garden, learn to compost or host a recycling program. They are also encouraged to teach those around them about hunger in Indiana. The battle over who will fill Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat on the Supreme Court is already underway in Washington. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott with those details. Almost immediately following the news of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, the battle over who will fill her seat on the Supreme Court began in Washington. President Trump tweeting this morning, we were put in a position of power and importance to make decisions for people who proudly elected us, the most important of which, the selection of United States Supreme Court justices. Sources tell ABC News President Trump has a short list of potential nominees, and before making any announcement, he is expected to speak with each of them. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell issuing a statement Friday night saying, President Trump's nominee will receive a vote on the floor of the United States Senate, and a reversal from his position in 2016. Obama, when he refused to consider continue. Merrick Garland, President Obama's nominee to the high court after Justice Antonin Scalia died that February. This vacancy should not be filled uh, by this lame duck president. Joe Biden calling on Republicans That's to be consistent. Voters should pick the president and the president should pick the justice for the Senate to consider. But McConnell well, says really this is a different situation with Republicans controlling both the White House and Senate. But at least one of those Republicans, Senator Lisa Murkowski, said Friday before the news of Ginsburg's death that she would not vote to confirm a Supreme Court nominee right now. And Maine's Republican Senator Susan Collins, who was locked in a tight race, telling the New York Times recently she would not vote on a nominee in October saying it's too close to the election. Rachel Scott, ABC News, Washington. 
Rachel, thank you. The FBI and Secret Service are investigating a poisonous package someone tried to send to President Trump. White House mail is screened off site before delivery, so law enforcement intercepted the package. They say it contained ricin. That's a toxic substance with a history of use in terror plots. A model that predicts the number of coronavirus deaths in the U.S. is changing course. It's now forecasting fewer deaths in January than it previously expected. We are talking about the Institute for Health Metrics and, and Evaluation at the University of Washington. This week, it predicted that the U.S. would most likely see more than 378,000 deaths from COVID-19 by January 1st. Last week, that number was more than 415,000. The forecasts have varied depending on mask usage. And Disney plans to reopen one of its water parks next year. The Walt Disney World Resort has two water parks, the Blizzard Beach Park and the Typhoon Lagoon Park. The company has not said which park would start accepting guests, but they are floating that it could happen on March 7th, 2021. They say the government first has to, to approve the reopening. The month of September continues to be very dry across the state, and that is why the state fire marshal is now putting out a warning for everyone to take precautions to avoid fires. With people outside enjoying the outdoors, whether you're camping, grilling out, or burning limbs or branches, the fire marshal has an important advice for you. He says always consider when the grass is very dry, fires can easily start and wind does play a factor. First, he encourages people to use a burn pit and a mesh screen to help contain fires. Certainly have a water source, if it's a garden hose, a bucket of water nearby. If you're going to be grilling out, we suggest um, you know, ensuring that you have uh, some type of extinguishment nearby. Letting those, if you're using charcoal, to let those coals cool down completely or utilizing a metal bucket to dispose of those in and then filling that with water. Well, tonight, two counties in Indiana have burn bans in place, Lawrence and Martin County. And Kyle, take a look at that, that grass there in that shot. It's very, very dry. It looks just like my <laughs> yard. Yeah, I'm going to need to start watering here if you haven't already. So it has now been more than a full month since we've had what we'll call a healthy rainfall across central Indiana. On August 18th, we picked up 0.85 inches of rain since then. Only four hundredths of an inch of rain has fallen officially in Indianapolis. That's why we have these very dry conditions overspreading the state, even some pockets of moderate drought. This is updated every Thursday, and I do think we'll see more drought overspreading central Indiana because we are not looking at any rainfall over the next several days. More beautiful sunshine, though, will be coming our way. Our temperature right now, 68 degrees. Look at that humidity with the dry conditions in place. It is only 28% with a northeast breeze now under 10 miles per hour. Temperature wise, most locations in the 60s. Connorsville, though, you've made it to 73. Well, it's 70 in Sullivan and 71 right now in the Terre Haute area. Those clear skies, though, we will see those numbers pretty quickly dropping off here. We're back into the middle 50s already at 10 o'clock tonight into the 40s and we may see a couple more 30s out there first thing on our Sunday morning, but I think that will be very isolated. Most of us will be in the lower half of the 40s here to start off Sunday 45 in Indianapolis 41 for you in the Columbus area and we will have blue skies for the Colts home opener tomorrow. The roof, the window both going to be open there at the stadium temperatures 50 degrees at 9 a.m. We'll jump about 10 degrees here as we get to late morning hours. And we do start a bit of a warming trend tomorrow. We will get into the lower 70s with sunny skies here. 73 in Bloomington, 72 for you in Danville, and even Kokomo getting back into the lower 70s. A little closer to average for this time of year. In fact, that warming trend is going to continue into next week as we keep things very dry here. There's that average high of 76. I think as we get into next week, we're actually back to around 80 degrees many afternoons. Let's go ahead and put it all together for you now in that seven day planning forecast. More sunshine for you on Sunday. Another great outdoor weather day. 73 degrees there. We'll start off in the 40s on Monday morning. That should be about the end of the 40s, though, as we continue this warming trend. It's 76 with sunshine on Monday. We'll get close to the 80 degree mark on Tuesday. And as we look at the second half of the forecast there, a few more clouds will build in. That's really going to be about the biggest change here as we'll have those lows in the 50s and highs will be right around 80 degrees. We may see some rain as we get into the second half of next weekend. From the station working for you, this is WRTV News at 6.
is streaming now. Racing resumes at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in just two weeks. After missing out on having fans at both the Brickyard 400 and Indy 500, IMS will be welcoming guests inside this time. Brad Brown has a look at the plan and how it all came together. This summer, there was an eerie emptiness for the two biggest weekends at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But this fall, fans will be back in the stands. We've stayed in contact with, uh, with the county health department, the state health department, really uh, throughout the years. We were thinking about our other events, and, and this one uh, we were pretty excited to, uh, uh, to, get that, uh, to get that approval from Dr. Kane. IMS has gotten the green flag to welcome 10,000 people to each day of the inaugural IndyCar Harvest GP, the first weekend of October. We wanted to have a number that we could manage. Uh, we wanted to have a number that we felt like was appropriate for the gates. We're going to have everybody come in either gate one, which is the gate behind us right here at, at turn one, or gate nine, which is the gate behind uh, turn four. Everyone entering will undergo temperature screenings and masks will be required throughout the speedway. A lot of good things happen around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's an outside event, and so we do know that COVID doesn't transfer as well outside, but at the same time, we had to think about how do you make sure we're making sure folks are safe? So the mask is a, is a, is a big piece of that. 5,000 seats will be sold in each of the IMS ovals turn one and turn four grandstands. Those are some of the best vantage points for the IndyCar road course doubleheader. As we were thinking about the Indy 500, we started thinking about where we were going to put people, even with at 25% capacity. So we did a lot of the work in terms of how the seating would work so that we can make sure that nobody is sitting in front of or behind you. You've at least got space uh, on one side or the other, really trying to distance folks uh, when they get inside. And if at the end of the day, a customer doesn't feel comfortable, we totally get it. We understand that. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing people here in May. Along with the IndyCar doubleheader that weekend, IMS will also host the Intercontinental GT and GT World Challenge Sports Car Series for an Indianapolis eight-hour endurance race. It's on that Sunday, October the 4th. Tickets for all of those events are on sale right now. You can visit IMS.com for more details. Brad Brown, WRTV Sports. Brad, thank you. There won't be a red carpet for the stars who usually glam it up for television's biggest night, but we will get a chance to peek into their living rooms in an Emmy Award show like no other. Hollywood's biggest stars won't be taking center stage from Staples Center, but instead from home. The Television Academy issued cameras to each nominee, sending 130 of them to 20 cities and 10 countries. But one thing will be the same. Veteran host Jimmy Kimmel is back. And also think about just trying to, to Zoom with your grandparents. And now imagine that we've got 150 celebrities who are uh, who haven't made themselves lunch in like 19 years. Many of them are now trying to connect technically to an award show. Well, tomorrow's primetime show on WRTV is the final night of the Emmy Awards season. Notable winners like Maya Rudolph and Brie Larson already claimed top spots at this year's Creative Arts Ceremony. Kyle, that is going to be interesting to watch tomorrow night, that's for sure. Yeah, I think it'll be kind of fun actually see inside some of those stars' homes, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well. Thank you so much for joining us on this digital version of WRTV News at 6. Join us right back here tonight at 11. Have a great night.